Thank you for joining us today in Community Conversations. My name is Sarah Dolsky and I'm the Executive Director of the Wallingford Emergency Shelter. I'm Ann Faust. I'm with the Middlesex County Coalition on Housing and Homelessness. Thanks for uh, being with us today, Ann. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for inviting me, Sarah. So I think what's really going to be interesting about this conversation is the different paradigms both of us have mm -hmm. when, um, when encountering the social, the societal issue of homelessness. Mm -hmm. um, because you work with a coalition which has more of an overarching mm -hmm. um, emphasis on you know, state and federal level, um, where I do more of the direct service. Yes. Yeah. So I'm a little curious to just uh -huh. hear a little bit about like the specifics of your agency, what you guys are responsible for. Mm -hmm. things of that nature. Well, this is a very exciting time to be working in the housing field. I've been working in um, housing since the 1980s, developing um, housing, and there is a real paradigm shift going on right now that we'll talk about. But first, I'm kind of on the advocacy and community awareness side, where Sarah's really the boots on the ground, and I think that we, we will complement each other nice. There are different types of homelessnesses. There's, there's so many different reasons why someone becomes homeless. And right now, when I ever get a night, what um, surprises a lot of people, that there's situational homelessness, where people have lost their housing for a variety of reasons, either um, they lost a job or had a health event. And they're typically homeless for a very short period of time and need very little social services just um, to get back on their feet. A lot of times, it's an issue really of just money, that they, they lost what they had and they need to save up for a security deposit, first month's rent, and that type of thing. And those make up about 80% any, of anyone who's homeless on a, on a given night. The, 20, the other 20% is chronically homeless, and that's your stereotypical homeless person that is characterized in the movies and things, you know, that, Those that you see. Those individuals that are on the street. On the street. And, and, yeah, um, living under bridges. And, and look like yeah. they've had a, a rough life. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they are, you know, the 20% of chronically homeless individuals, they're the ones that, that do need a lot of services, have a lot of barriers to getting um, to homeless. And what we've been learning is that there's a way to assess people's needs and, and that you can give people um, what they need to get back on their feet sometimes with a very uh, light touch, a little bit of money, and sometimes they need much more extensive mm -hmm. services like, like the services that the emergency shelter gives out. So if I'm understanding you correctly, Anne, what you're saying is there's two different groups. Really, mm -hmm. you have those individuals, like we had talked about, um, the first images that come to mind when we mm -hmm. think of homeless um, yes. on the street, maybe substance abuse, mental illness. Mm -hmm. And then you have another population that is more of uh, kind of the, the homelessness um, mm -hmm. that can fall, fall beneath the crack that can be our neighbors, yes. um, our friends, mm -hmm. you know, people that have just had a series of events in their life that have caused them to fall down on hard times. Mm -hmm. And they're, what they need might be different from the stereotypical yes. chronic homeless individuals. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So s some of the um, interventions we have for the situational homelessness, a lot of times it really is um, just money. And, and I'm going to give you some statistics that really, they shocked me when I looked them up about Wallingford. In Wallingford, 5% of the population lives in poverty, but there's 22% that fall in between um, being able to meet a survival budget and poverty. We call that the Alice population, mm -hmm. asset limited income constrained but employed. It's like the working poor. Mm -hmm. Connecticut United Way did a study on every town in the state to measure what the Alice population was. And in Wallingford, it, it's 27 percent. So that's now, almost... Now, is that like high compared to other towns? It's higher than the state average, um, okay. but not that much higher. And this is the working poor. This is people that have your mm -hmm. stereotypical nine to five jobs. Yes. But, yeah. um, but for whatever reason, can't make ends meet. Families the biggest two um, expenses are housing and child care. Mm -hmm. um, and for an individual, it's housing. The studies that have been done say that if you're spending more than 30% of your income on housing, that makes it very unstable. Mm -hmm. You're one car repair away, one medical ev um, event away from being able to, to pay your bills and, and yeah. pay the rent. We've actually seen that a lot because we have the emergency yeah. shelter yes. and we have the beds for 15 single adults mm -hmm. and then we have the four family units and I would say about 90 percent of our population that's in the family units mm -hmm. are within that Alice. Yes. You know they yeah. have full-time jobs, um, they tend to be single women, mm -hmm. you know single mothers um, working and mm -hmm. uh, just for whatever reason can't afford child care or just mm -hmm. are so 
weighed down by the expense of living, it's very easy for them to slip beneath yes. the cracks. Yep. And they need that extra assistance just to get back up on their, their feet. feet. Well, and when you think of how much it would cost to get a security deposit, some landlords require a two-month security deposit and first month's rent. If you can find, even find a rent for eight hundred dollars you you're know, that, doing that, darn good yeah yeah, yeah. yeah that's mm -hmm. a lot in wallingford 26 percent of homeowners 47 percent of renters are paying more than 30 percent of their income for housing wow so that yeah. just shows the need that we need to create different types of housing mm -hmm. affordable housing you know some people get scared with the word affordable housing yeah, can you define that for sure. me yeah. well affordable housing can be what they call their 80 percent of area median income and below mm -hmm. some people refer to it as workforce housing uh -huh. it can be for, for for people who have very low income with some subsidies you know like um, a, a rental uh, certificate or something but it could just be um, housing that is maybe smaller or that has some financing involved so that it could be an affordable and it really is economic development a, a town a community is healthy when there are people who can afford to pay their rent and then have some money left over to to uh, buy goods and services from the right. small businesses in town. Which Wallingford is well known for, for our mom and pops. Yes, uh, yeah. exactly. So it's so, giving back yeah. to the community in some way, you well, know, in entertainment yeah. and the non-necessary, you know, yeah. fun, yep. funds. And um, if 47% of your renters are living on the edge, uh, it's, it's not good for anybody. Right. So I would encourage, you know, the town to think of some options and different ways where they could mm -hmm. create housing that would be affordable more for of everybody. A, more of a holistic approach. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so that that's how people fall into you know, situational homelessness. Some of the programs that exist is called rapid rehousing, mm -hmm. where it's a light touch. They don't need a lot of services and case management. All they need is a security deposit, first month's rent, and maybe a, a small subsidy for only a few months, and then they can be back on their feet. Mm -hmm. um, now, are these programs somewhat new? I know that you said that you had been yes. in the, the business of yes. housing since yes. the 1980s. Um, so you're naming a few uh, different uh, programs, such as rapid rehousing, housing, affordable yes. housing. Mm -hmm. um, so just talk to me a little bit about like how the, uh, the climate mm -hmm. the, has changed over the past yeah. few years. Um, I think it's, it's with a lot of research. Um, you know, with the rapid rehousing research that they've done, um, they found out that it, it's in the high 80s uh, percent success rate, where okay. over 80 percent of people who get just a very short subsidy, they do not return into the homeless system. We collect nationwide data now as to who comes into the shelters, mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to track, and it really is a high success rate mm -hmm. when people... Um, First, we're, we're a little skeptic as it, if such a light touch was going to work, and we've proven that it does. Yeah. Um, so, so that's exciting. The other big paradigm shift has been permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. um, and this is for people who do need more services. They have more barriers to housing. They might have substance abuse and mental health issues. Going back to our issues. two demographics, this yes. would be the stereotypical. Yeah. Yes, it could be, yep. Before, you used to have to earn your way to an apartment. You'd mm -hmm. have to be sober for 30 days. Right. You'd have to... Um, I remember those days. Yes. You'd have to do sign up for counseling or be in some kind of a program yeah. and get your life all set in order. And then once that has happened, then we can present you with the housing. Mm -hmm. then you've shown that you've graduated to the next level. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what, what people who are homeless have told me is being being homeless is a full-time job in and of mm -hmm. itself to figure out where you're going to stay warm, where you're going to sleep at night. Well, so, and you just think of the transportation. Uh, yeah, you know, what yeah. takes you and I with a vehicle 20 minutes, you know, yeah. to get oh, from point yeah. A to point B could take two or three hours. Oh, absolutely. You know, with Especially an individual in that has to take public transportation. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now they know that once somebody gets stable housing and a roof over their heads, they're much more likely to work on the issues that got them homeless to begin with. Which makes sense to me because mm -hmm. I, I know with our residents, being homeless is such a traumatic event. Oh, and yeah. you think of them being in crisis and how any of us would respond to a crisis situation. Mm -hmm. And we're not on our top game at that point. Yeah. But you yeah. get me into something permanent, something stable, then I can start working on some of the deeper issues. Mm -hmm. And if I need follow-up care, 
-hmm. I know who to call. Yeah. I know the agencies to reach out to. Yes. You know, and I can kind of then at that point decide how much care I need dependent on my specific situation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the paradigm to me has been tailored more to the individual. Yes, and absolutely. And it's been supported by, by concrete data, mm -hmm. you know, which is, is showing that this is the better way to go. Mm -hmm. The more efficient, more cost efficient, more uh, delicate for the individual, socially, you know, yes. socially yeah. aware. You know, yeah. And it makes sense intuitively. And, and it's humane. And, and they have also tracked costs. And when somebody is homeless, they typically cycle in and out of um, a residential drug treatment facility. They, sometimes they're incarcerated. And it's, it's very expensive mm -hmm. to treat it a, as an emergency or to ignore it than it is to offer permanent supportive housing, rental certificate, and the, the supports they need to be successful. It is cost effective and right. um, so which is really mind blowing for people when you yes. think that, that it would be more cost effective to mm -hmm. put a chronically homeless individual into permanent housing mm -hmm. but you start to think of the price of housing them of feeding them mm -hmm. um, if they have emergency room visits things like that oh, yeah. uh, yeah. transportation it does start to add up those little things do start to add up mm -hmm. so it really is encouraging to hear hey not only is it more humane mm -hmm. but for those who are very focused on the economical advantages oh, yeah. so have you had somebody in the emergency shelter who you've seen go into permanent supportive housing and, and been successful with that? Yes, yeah, actually I have. Again, it's assessing the needs of the client, you know, mm -hmm. getting to know them on an individual basis, what the best services for them would be at the proper mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I'm actually in the process of um, hooking up one of our families with a supportive housing mm -hmm. unit. That's been a very interesting experience for me. The mother does have some mental health um, mm -hmm. issues, difficulties. Mm -hmm. To know that she can transition into the next level mm -hmm. where she has that case management, all those support systems there to reach out to, mm -hmm. you know, gives me a sense of peace and mm -hmm. I'm not you know sending them out on their way saying best of luck to you yes that takes time that takes relationship that mm -hmm. takes trust mm -hmm. you know for them to get to that point where they can open up um, to mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. enough that um, and be vulnerable enough to kind of make you aware of what they're struggling with so that you know you know the proper channel to move them mm -hmm. into yeah and then yeah. I've encountered the other type too mm -hmm. um, you know the non-traditional homeless person the working mm -hmm. poor um, yes. And I have so many success stories with that, mm -hmm. um, with that population. And uh, we have several. We actually just recently hired um, a formerly homeless individual mm -hmm. oh, who, um, who was, we were able to uh, settle him into some permanent housing. Mm -hmm. um, he had a part-time job in the meantime. And, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and it's, it, that's really, I would say, one of the most rewarding aspects of what I do. Like, yeah, yeah. I tell people... I get, uh, I get paid to help others. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's kind of a dream it's, job. It's like you should just do is. this, but I get a paycheck with it. Yeah, um, yeah. So that is definitely, you know, one of the upsides. Great. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm all for the two different, uh, you know, really focusing on the needs of the two different types. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For the people who don't know about the emergency shelter, can you just tell us a little bit about it, um, how it started, mm -hmm. how someone can get services if they need it? Mm-hmm. Sure. The emergency shelter is a little different from your traditional shelter, um, mm -hmm. mainly in its history, because it was very much of a grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. um, so about 20 years ago, many of the people in Wallingford decided to come together and uh, create a place for people who were experiencing homelessness or mm -hmm. some of their neighbors who, you know, might be in a difficult situation. Um, so it began with them just kind of migrating from church to church, place to place, uh, just a group of volunteers that really wanted to do good. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually we were able to purchase the old bank building on mm -hmm. Quinnipiac Street. And that's our current location where we serve 15 individuals, um, mm -hmm. 10 men and five women. Mm -hmm. and that is primarily staffed by volunteers, so we still have that grassroots, you know, more organic, person-to-person um, yeah. -person friendly feeling. Yeah, it, it really sounds like the, the town of Wallingford really stepped up um, to make this happen and that you have a really broad base of support. Um, that's really nice to see in a community when, when that happens. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we are very lucky. Wallingford is very well known for taking care of its own mm -hmm. and that extends to even those who are most vulnerable mm -hmm. so it's really an honor to work here the town is our primary funder our primary supporter Mary Dickinson has been wonderful mm -hmm. um, you know it's 
it's very much of a community feel. It's very mm -hmm. much of a home feel when you're in the shelter. Like, um, I've worked in several shelters over the years, um, some in the inner city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a completely different feel. It's much more family um, and much more of like a homey feel. And even our volunteers mm -hmm. will come in mm -hmm. and make mention of that, you know. And yeah, yeah. um, we have a plethora of volunteers. They serve in the kitchen. They serve um, as assistants for our night staff. Mm -hmm. They also I have a few that help me in the office with some of the administrative ends. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone is interested in volunteering with our shelter, we do have a, um, a uh, link on our website, wallingfordshelter.org, mm -hmm. and there you can volunteer with us, sign up for a particular day, mm -hmm. um, come in for some training, and you know, if nothing else, it's a really good experience mm -hmm. um, and a little bit of a, a nice way to give back to the communal, community locally. Great. And then in addition to the emergency shelter, mm -hmm. we also have our four family units. Mm -hmm. um, so the first family unit was created in memory of Martin B. Rubin, mm -hmm. who was a philanthropist um, in the area. So mm -hmm. we built those about four years ago. Yeah. And since then, it housed 15 people, mm -hmm. uh, 15 families. I think it comes to a total of 35 uh, mm -hmm. you know, individuals, 20-some children. Mm -hmm. And then uh, recently, actually, just this July, we opened the, uh, the doors to our new family unit, the mm -hmm. Fred Albrook Jr. family oh, unit. that's wonderful. Um, so we have two new units there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was largely um, supported by the town, by private um, funders and mm -hmm. philanthropists who really wanted to do something nice. Um, mm -hmm. And we are full almost constantly. Um, and um, how long can people stay in the family shelter if they need assistance? Um, it's a four-month program, mm -hmm. although, although there is a little flexibility because every case is a little different from mm -hmm. the next. Um, so sometimes we move people out faster. You mm -hmm. know, we just had a resident move into permanent housing in two and a half uh, months, which mm -hmm. was really nice. Um, we were able to tap into some of those rapid rehousing funds that you were referring to. Mm -hmm. um, some We were able to get help with the security deposits. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's again, even those are, are tailored to the needs of the individual. Mm -hmm. that, that's great. So Sarah, one other thing I learned today is that, that your shelter is a seasonal shelter, meaning that it's only open part of the year. Yes. Um, so can you tell me about um, when it's open and also when you're closed, what should people do um, if, if they know someone who is homeless and the, the emergency shelter is closed? That's a really good question because, as you know, homelessness doesn't you know, end when the weather gets warm. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we are only able to provide services during the colder months. We open our doors November 1st and mm -hmm. we close them April 15th. So mm -hmm. you know, those months are really the, the cold months. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's, you know, it's a really good thing that we're open because currently at this time, you know, with the weather being as bad as it is mm -hmm. we are at full capacity mm -hmm. um, and we are we have in years past had to throw mattresses down mm -hmm. um, you know and really exceed uh, you know how much we are designed to take mm -hmm. in if you will just to really mm -hmm. um, keep people from being in situations that are dangerous oh, for their yeah, health absolutely because yeah, we I don't mean, want to hear any horror stories of somebody freezing to death outside some of your clients come regularly and then on April 1st you shut your doors so um, do you have a housing plan for people who, um, or some type of plan, so that on April 1st people know uh, where they're going to go? Yeah, so um, most of our people actually do, at that point, they've prepared themselves sufficiently to mm -hmm. move into some kind of a permanent housing situation, mm -hmm. or friends and family are willing to step in, you know, if, if mm -hmm. it, uh, it's permanent housing hasn't been secured. Um, and then for the, the few stray folks that, mm -hmm. uh, that don't have anywhere to go, I collaborate with, um, with the other providers in mm -hmm. the Meriden and Middletown area, and they're mm -hmm. often able to take them in at that point. Because they're, they're not at capacity Because they're the not at capacity when the warmer. weather gets warmer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because yeah. we do have a population um, that I don't specifically work with, but we mm -hmm. do have outreach through other agencies such as Rushford, um, Columbus House will provide um, mm -hmm. homeless outreach, and they'll uh, go to those individuals who would prefer to stay in the woods during the warmer months mm -hmm. and really provide them the services that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so the shelter is our, uh, less full during the warmer months. Right. So if somebody um, presents himself to somebody in Wallingford and, and um, somebody knows that this person doesn't have a, a place to stay, what, what should they do if they, if they know... Um, you know, somebody that they know on the street corner um, doesn't have a place to stay. Mm -hmm. What should they do? Well, I would suggest, you know, either reaching out to myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can call the main line. Our number is 203-294-0102 um, and ask to speak with me directly, and I can take it from there. 
or if you wanted to do a more direct um, supportive route, uh, you would dial 211, and that's mm -hmm. the info line, the crisis info line. Mm -hmm. um, they also help with housing um, and any any uh, difficulties um, mm -hmm. that may arise. So they would um, ask to speak with a service specialist there at uh, at 211 once they dial, mm -hmm. and uh, they would be able to set up a, uh, a meeting with a service specialist at Masters Manor here in Wallingford, mm -hmm. um, and we could really take it from there at that point. Mm -hmm. So. What type of services do you connect uh, people with who are staying at the shelter? So we have a lot of work um, training programs that we work with directly, um, such as CT Works is a very popular one where they can mm -hmm. get computer training, um, they can get uh, just on-the-job training um, through that agency. We also mm -hmm. work with Strive, which is a little bit more intense. It's a three-week mm -hmm. program. Um, we've just actually had some recent graduates from that program, mm -hmm. um, so we were very, very happy about that. And and what do the what do they do once they graduate from the Strive program? Well, they're um, they follow up with case management uh -huh. um, <clears throat> and job, you know, helping with job searches and uh -huh. um, just getting their clients involved <clears throat> more on a community level. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we do we do connect them with uh, with work and employment resources. Mm -hmm. um, several of our clients suffer with mental health mm -hmm. difficulties or substance abuse issues. So Rushford is another agency that we'll reach out to quite frequently mm -hmm. um, to get them into an inpatient program um, or a partial hospital program where they can receive receive the treatment that they need mm -hmm. while still residing at the shelter. Um, and we also work with a community health center to mm -hmm. address our clients' physical well-being. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. So what are, what are your biggest challenges as far as running the shelter, the organization? Um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges that you're facing? Well, the first thing that pops into my mind is finances, of course, because oh, who's obviously. not struggling, you yeah. know? And for us, um, it's particularly difficult because we just got our 100% of our state funding cut. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, $35,000 that we no longer receive. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, you know, kind of cutting back costs. Mm -hmm. We were already pretty strapped before, mm -hmm. um, but just trying to make the little that we have go a little bit longer. And, and what's what are some of the... Um, things that you've done to cut costs? Looking into private grants and foundations. Uh -huh. um, you know, Liberty Bank has been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, I know that yeah. they work with you guys as well as yes. a partner. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and their our foundation, United Ways, our I'm United sure. Ways have been yeah. very helpful as well. Yeah. Um, you know, just private banks, mm -hmm. um, you know, and family foundations kind of tapping into those resources. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit more, a little bit more community awareness as well, um, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of private, you know, funders out there mm -hmm. who maybe they have a hundred dollars, but I mean, a hundred dollars if you get ten people who give a hundred dollars that's a thousand dollars right there yeah. you know and can people donate through your website they're able to donate through okay, our website great. yep they can yeah. make a donation mm -hmm. um, right there it takes care of everything yep right before this program I, I met Sarah at the shelter and she was telling me um, some of the cost-cutting measures they've done is that they don't hire someone to to plow and shovel they do it themselves mm -hmm. um, cleaning bathrooms cleanings, you know. yeah, yeah. so they they're really um, they're very uh, much a grassroots organization and they, they depend on their volunteers to get things done. So I, I was very impressed when I saw it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're quite proud of our little organization. Mm -hmm. So we are small, but we are mighty. Yes. <laughs> and I like to joke with our residents that come in and some of our volunteers that we are definitely the five star of homeless shelters. <laughs> you know, so, um, yeah. and I mean, and it's the volunteers. It's also the food that we get donated to us through Choate. Mm -hmm. You know, they've been wonderful. We are so. We're so happy with that partnership. Um, oh, yeah, they also contribute good. a little financially as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, yeah, we, we take what we can get. We work with mm -hmm. it, and, you know, it never seems to, you look at the papers and you're like, okay, we're not going to have enough funds to cover everything, but it always seems to turn out in the end some way. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it's getting that last check and you're like, oh, thank goodness, you know. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Everyone yeah. working in the nonprofit world knows that feeling. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so now we're, we'll talk a little bit more about the systems change, too, that has happened. Um, I, you know, work with the Middlesex County Coalition on Housing and Homelessness, and people are probably wondering what does that have to do with Wallingford. Um, well, th the state set up what they call coordinated access networks. Um, in the past, um, if somebody was homeless, they would have to call shelter to shelter to shelter to find a place that had an opening. And now we have what we call coordinated access networks. And um, 
there's eight networks around the state, and they combined Middlesex County with Meriden and Wallingford, where one coordinated access network. And the reason they did this is they looked at, um, at transportation patterns, and they looked at where people were going to shelters. And it turns out that, you know, with the public transportation that goes along Route 66, that a lot of people who were using the Wallingford and the Meriden shelter were also using the shelters in Middlesex County. Mm -hmm. So that's why they put us together, even though traditionally we're not um, a cu two communities that have worked together um, very often. Mm -hmm. And um, this partnership has really gone well. Um, yeah. yeah. We, we meet every other week with both both service providers from Meriden and Wallingford and Middlesex County. Uh, we alternate where the meetings are once they're in the Meriden Wallingford area and sometimes they're in the Middlesex County area. And so now it makes it much easier for a client. They have to call 211 they can find out where there's an open bed, they can get an appointment um, to be assessed for what type of um, services would be best for them. Um, and Sarah has been a really great participant in our coordinated access network. Um, I'd like to just hear from you, your thoughts about it and, and how it's working. Yeah, well I think the system's change is really beneficial for twofold mm -hmm. reasons. Um, the first is the collaboration uh -huh. that happens between the different providers, which is really essential. Um, on, to give you an example, uh, a few days ago we uh, we had a prior um, we got together to talk about particular clients that we really felt needed to be prioritized for housing, uh -huh. um, and all of us came to the table, which is something relatively new, and communicated with one another about our experiences with this individual. In the past a person might have been at your shelter, might have been at shelter now in Meriden, might would have been, been at the no Eddie Center. There communication, and, and, right, and, yes, right. And nobody knew. But we could all sit around the table and say, okay, yes, this person is very much in need. They're with you now. They were with me last month. They were, uh -huh. you know, over here a year ago. Clearly, you know, uh -huh. this, they're, they're encountering some difficulties. You know, let's really step up and, and meet the needs. So the collaboration uh -huh. has been just it's made the process so much smoother I feel like and mm -hmm. you know in different communities have different resources mm -hmm. so you know to keep everything kind of in a little bubble mm -hmm. um, you know is I think limits the amount of services that we can provide for the clients mm -hmm. um, but and this business is so esoteric too mm -hmm. that uh, that being able to collaborate with someone that maybe is a little bit more gifted in the housing area and another mm -hmm. person that's a little bit more gifted in the technical area, um, I think has really benefited everyone. Mm -hmm. So the collaboration between the providers has been wonderful, and I think also the ability to prioritize the needs of the individuals. Because mm -hmm. it used to be that if you presented yourself, it was on a first come first serve basis. Mm -hmm. But now we're able to sit down and really assess the vulnerability of an individual yeah. and say, okay they are really in need here like as opposed to you know someone that comes to the shelter because they were fighting with their girlfriend mm -hmm. and they need a place to stay for two nights you yes, know yeah. where you can kind of divert them mm -hmm. not you know shut the door to them but really divert them help them maybe mm -hmm. make that phone call to the girlfriend you know hey he's really sorry yeah, you know yeah, he's yeah. really in a dire situation and kind of like streamline that yeah um so that that's been hugely beneficial you, i'm, as I'm well. glad you brought that up that's called diversion and that that is something we never thought of of, um, really concentrating on before either is to divert somebody from going in the shelter door to try to reconnect them with family members or a spouse or a girlfriend and mm -hmm. um, and and that's been very successful is this diversion to to prevent someone from ever entering the shelter door to try to mend those bridges um, Cause correct me if I'm wrong Ian but from what I understand once a person enters the system mm -hmm. it's tremendously more difficult to get out of the system and, so and the best way traumatic. much more traumatic and so the best way is to really prevent that entry from happening mm -hmm. um, you know give them the resources they need to yeah. keep them out of the shelters yeah because once you're in and I've seen it time and time again once you're in it's really really hard to break out of that because yeah. I think you made mention of you know just finding an apartment mm -hmm. you know you're looking at putting up you know a thousand dollars right yeah. in the beginning when they want first month's rent you know um, mm -hmm you know, the security deposit, it starts to add up. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep somebody in the housing that they have currently, mm -hmm. you know, through assistance in providing that case management within their home, yes. you know, as a preventative step, as mm -hmm. a divert, as a, you know, being able to divert them, mm -hmm. then it's better for everybody. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and now that there's one um, list that people are on with, the, with their assessments, the people who wind up getting permanent supportive housing, which is the most intensive services, are the people that are really 
very vulnerable yes. and are, are most likely um, to, to be harmed, most likely to have health events or even die because they're out on the street. And yes. so yeah. um, it's really, it's, it's saving lives and it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. It's the less expensive thing, just much better outcome. So, I mean, it's, it's really an exciting time to be in the field right now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Sarah, it's, it's been really nice talking with you today. I really enjoyed seeing your shelter this afternoon, and I wish you the best of luck um, with the rest of your season. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and as we both know, homelessness isn't an issue that's going to go away anytime soon. So, you know, thank you for the work that you do on the larger level, and we'll continue to hold it down on the ground floor. Sounds like a great partnership. <laughs> Thank you.